Steve's range as a newsman, forget about all his other accomplishments and being the managing editor who put up with all the other guys um, who were out running around the world and closing his eyes as he signed off on their expense accounts and whatever he used to do as managing editor. As a reporter, he's written seven books in his spare time. Here's one. This is called Eagle on the Street. He wrote this with David Vise. This was a sort of a clip job from his Pulitzer Prize winning reporting for the Washington Post. <laughs> Here's another one. This is called Ghost Wars. This is about, uh, oh, what did anybody know about the events that led up to September 11, 2001? This is a Pulitzer Prize for <laughs> Books, nonfiction, unbelievable read. He's now, by the way, taking his precious time with us. We arranged this in last October. Even though at 3 o'clock, this institution at 116th and Broadway is handing out the Pulitzer Prizes. So I, I really appreciate that he's here. Now, here's another book. And I, uh, this is a great book. And I got to say, when you can find a woman in Orlando, Florida, who played the piano for the father of Osama bin Laden to open the book, that's pretty good. <laughs> I mean, I, I like to troll places to find unusual characters, you know, to make the story come alive. But this, this book is really something. And I actually have an extra copy, which... If somebody wants to buy it, I will sell for what it costs, 20 bucks, so he can sign it for you. If you don't, I'll ask him to sign both of them, and I won't put it on eBay. I'll give it to one of my... Oh, it's... Okay. Okay, we got to take her there. And then there's this little... Uh, he, did a, he did books also about the breakup of AT&T and the takeover of Getty Oil. And then there's this little one, his most recent work, which I notice he writes more and more, you know, when, uh, as you get older, I guess you, you understand more. So his books have gone from 300 pages to almost 700. But this is, uh, this one, Private Empire, Exxon Mobil, and American Power is also dazzling. And I'm, I'm holding up the audio cassette because if you're planning to drive to California, by the time you get back, you'll finish the book. <laughs> it's really terrific. Steve hasn't been fed. It's, it's five to one, but maybe we should... St Let's start. You ready, Steve? Great. Well, thank you, Alan, uh, very much for that uh, generous introduction. And it's uh, very good to be with you. It's good to be with... Uh, Sarah and Steve, um, I'm a relative newcomer to journalism education and really only nine months into learning about it, but I'm having a great time. I don't know how many um, Columbia alums are here. Yeah, good number. Um, well, thank you for all of your engagement with the school and, um, you know, for all the a light uh, joking about uh, CUNY. I, I really don't think that uh, the competition between us is as important as the common uh, dilemmas and opportunities we face in shaping uh, journalism education and articulating its value also at a time when uh, there are lots of competing narratives out there about where journalism is going and, and what it means anymore. And I thought I would use my time really just to talk a little bit about what it is. Um, after all of the years in practice of journalism, I feel like I'm confronting coming into an institution like Columbia that has to consider uh, what should be taught, why it should be taught, uh, where uh, technology is and is not changing the requirements of journalism and therefore journalism education, and a little bit about what I, what I think is really going on in our, in our field, in our shared profession, as a, at, at the level that at least a school like Columbia that um, tries to look out over a 10 or 20 year horizon as it thinks about the value it creates for its students, the, what, what it is that we have to think about. 
So I'll start just with a little bit of a, of a story that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but it did come to mind after spending Thursday and Friday working on the Pulitzer Prize judging. Comes out at 3 o'clock. I'm, I'm unfortunately not able to give you a preview of the winners, but uh, I, can, I can tell you that, uh, you know, if you look, think about 2013 as a year, certainly the nominations reflected two of the big stories um, in, the, in our country. One, um, of course, the Snowden leaks and the revelations and the way those were managed and the very intense public debate that followed uh, those disclosures. And then secondly, perhaps not as readily jumping to mind, just because the calendar might not jump immediately to mind, but last a year ago, uh, the Boston um, Marathon bombings, uh, one of the biggest breaking news stories uh, in a long while. And it was the, you know, there's been a lot of discourse about how journalism is implicated by the Snowden disclosures, whether journalism did its job, who's a journalist, uh, how, how the balance between uh, the public interest and, and national security should be managed in a case like that, whether the comparisons to the Pentagon Papers are sound, all of those debates are familiar. There's been less debate about the way the coverage of the Boston Marathon bombings unfolded, and I wonder if there shouldn't uh, have been in proportion more of that. One of the stories that uh, I think probably didn't get as much attention as it might have uh, in the aftermath of that very demanding, chaotic, and uh, uneven coverage, great in some instances and, and really poor in other instances, is the story of a, of a young um, student at Brown University named Sunil Tripathi. I don't know if that name springs to mind uh, for many of you, but he was um, a student at Brown. I don't know if he was a freshman or a sophomore, but he disappeared in March of 2013, and his family became very concerned about him, and they used social media to try to call attention to the fact that he was missing. He seemed to be troubled psychologically, but, uh, and his family had an instinct that he might have um, disappeared because he was troubled. And so they basically put out word, where is he? Where is he gone? And uh, then a month later, when the bombings took place, um, quite a lot of user-generated crowdsourced social media sites sprang into action with a great deal of ambition to essentially solve the crime of the Boston Marathon bombings. And one of those uh, sites, Reddit, which is a very uh, heavily trafficked, user-generated site, created a kind of user group that was basically devoted to finding the bombers while the police manhunt was going on. And in the course of that, not professional journalists, but users attempting to channel the wisdom of crowds looking at photographs and lots of other fragments of evidence that had come out of the chaos of the moment after the bombings, somehow identified uh, Sunil Tripathi as a potential uh, suspect in this case. And when the police um, put out a couple of photos of un unidentified individuals that turned out to be the actual criminals, but they, at that time they hadn't ID'd them, these photos also circulated and there was a, there was a finding in some of the corners of this um, social media uh, institution that Suspect number two was, in fact, Sunil Tripathi. Well, on August 23rd, which I think was maybe three days after the bombings, uh, his body turned up in the waters off of Providence. He'd taken his own life. And that was how his family discovered where he was. Uh, Reddit's general manager issued a, an apology for the content that its users, unfiltered, had generated on the site. And uh, I. I wanted to write it down exactly. He said that there had been, uh, in the response to the bombings, aspects of online witch hunts and dangerous speculation, and that he was deeply regretful about that. Now, of course, it's, it's uh, presumptuous to find cause and effect in this troubled young man's uh, suicide, but the correlation between the, the way his name was um, bandied about uh, in social media and his, and his um, end, you know, certainly disturbing. But it wasn't social media alone that made errors in this coverage. Of course, the New York Post famously published a photograph of two young men carrying bags that uh, turned out to have nothing to do with the crimes, although it does seem that they came to that photograph through a similar 
channel of social media kind of crowdsourcing and, and made a judgment to use it uh, that turned out to be regrettable. Um, but it raises a whole series of questions that our faculty, and I'm sure at CUNY, their faculty are grappling with every day with young students who come in all fired up about the new possibilities of journalism, because there are many of them being opened up by this technological revolution, but how to define um, an intersection between the purposes and values of professional journalism and the um, mind-boggling array of new open opportunities for citizen and amateur participation in journalism. It's one in a whole series of dilemmas about how technology and, and journalism and change are intersecting. Are intersecting. So let me just take a couple of minutes to talk about how um, I, th my own sort of two cents with the team that I'm working with at Columbia, what four kind of big ideas we think matter most around this intersection. And the first and the most encompassing is this question of how to interrogate uh, the new technologies that are interacting with publishers, broadcasters, and journalists every day to um, find in them the traps but also the opportunities that will lead to journalism that matters, journalism that will endure, journalism that has the same um, public purpose and democratic purpose that the best journalism has had since it became a profession, you know, roughly 150 years ago. And I think in order to approach that hard question, you sort of have to step back a little bit and recognize that the idea that our generation, and I'll include myself as an honorary uh, Solarian, um, the idea that we grew up with, that there were professional standards, ethical um, standards, not always easy to apply in every case, but a kind of peer-reviewed culture of what was excellent, what was ethical, what was public-minded, um, that that discourse, which really unfolded in the period, was informed by journalism going back to the 19th century, but it really gelled in the period after the Second World War when a couple of things happened all at once. One was you had an unusually long period of stable business models in both broadcasting and newspapers. So you had the emergence of licensed uh, broadcasters that had strong economic models, and part of their licensing bargain was to uh, perform journalism in the public interest in exchange for the unique right to hold this broadcasting license. Then you had newspapers that really through an accident of business history started to consolidate in every major metropolitan area and they built up these big stable newsrooms that were like civil services. Uh, in, even though uh, if you worked at an evening paper you might find yourself um, in a period of tumult as habit shifted and the economic shifted to the morning paper almost certainly you could migrate from an evening paper to a now even richer and more secure morning paper. And that was the world that I grew up in. I entered the Washington Post in 1985, came out the other side in 2005, 20 years in. And, and for much of the time that I was working as a reporter or an editor at the paper, I never even um, thought about whether the economy was in recession or whether there were economic pressures on the paper because the paper was so doing so well, was so impervious to economic changes that we were just sent out to chase our stories, get on the next plane, and, and go, go, go. And in that period, so you had an economic foundation for professional stability in journalism. It lasted roughly from 1950 until 2005, really, in a manner of speaking. You also had other things going on. You had the rise of uh, professions as self-conscious, peer-reviewed places where great doctors would decide what minimum requirements there were to practice medicine in the United States, where lawyers regulated quite a lot of the ethical conduct of uh, law, where accountants and other professions claimed the mantle of respectability through the, through the development of peer-reviewed professional associations. And journalists 
Of course, we don't have a licensed profession, so our claim on this role was always a little bit tenuous, but we were clearly influenced by the idea of peer-reviewed professional standards, achievements, and, and values, and ethics. And that the fact that we could develop this culture, these ideas, write down these codes, debate them at annual conferences, it was, again, important that we did this in a period of relative stability. So there was the, the same editors and, and institutions were coming to the same questions and working them forward and holding one another accountable. And then I think also the other factor as I think back on that 50 years is that there was an emergence in social science and in the professions and in journalism of the sort of the idea of the scientific method, that you could be led by evidence uh, and peer review um, to something that wasn't the truth with a capital T, but was more reliable than uh, the findings that you would discover by other methods. And this gave rise in journalism to you know, the cult of objectivity, which is now under some assault, but the, I think of uh, what you could call fairness or inclusion or um, complete work, you want work that is full, but I, I think of it myself still as a practitioner trying to struggle for what it is that, that uh, I want to make sure I do when I finish a book or work on a magazine piece. I still think of it as, as related to the application of the scientific method to sort of social science, to investigating a complex question. You want the evidence to lead you. You don't want other biases to lead you to the extent that you're hum humanly able to pull it off. So all these things happened. They came together and they created the culture that we grew up in. They created the values that we would articulate that I'm sure you still hold dear. And then this great double disruption started to unfold over the last 10 or 15 years. First, the rise of digital technology, which collapsed the barriers to entry in both broadcasting and uh, print, and created a whole new series of very positive possibilities for individuals to enter into journalism who would previously have been locked out by the, the walls of these monopoly newspapers or these impervious broadcasters. And I celebrate the democratic effects of the collapse of barriers to entry into journalism. But they were the, the kind of floodgates, the tide of change that digital technology created, both disrupting business models but also empowering all kinds of new points of entry into journalism happened very suddenly and it has challenged a lot of the ethical and professional inheritance that, that, um, that I think we share. And then you had the Great Recession. I mean, let's remember, we had the worst economic recession in 60 years, coming right on top of a secular disruption of the structure of journalism. You put those two things together, in the darkest hours of 2009, if you were a newspaper publisher, you really did not know how much of the free fall you were experiencing was cyclical. That is, it would bottom out and there would be a recover, recovery when the recession ended, and how much of it was secular, that is, this is never coming back. And that produced a real crisis of confidence in a lot of newsrooms. They shrank desperately to try to stay alive in some cases. They, they shrank desperately uh, because they, they weren't sure where the bottom was, and it was sort of the only management instinct some of them could find. Now we're coming out of this um, double crisis and confronting the fact that the secular change is profound, and the cyclical recovery is not going to be um, a rocket to the moon. And, but at least we have a more stable environment in which we can look at some of these questions about technological change. Now, we could spend a lot of time talking about uh, digital technology and data journalism, but I'll just finish this sort of section by, by saying a couple of things about it. My own sense is that we've, we're moving from the first era, in, in an editorial sense, in a journalistic sense, we're moving from the first era of digital journalism to something like the second. The, in the first, the engagement with the implications of this technology was uh, located very heavily in the changes of audience behavior. So audience consumption patterns changed very radically as new devices and new channels opened up en masse. And journalists had to figure out through social media engagement, through business strategies, through editorial strategies, through multimedia strategies, how to respond to this change in audience behavior enabled by the sort of glorious fungibility of digital technology. 
In the second era that I feel like we're wrestling with now, certainly we're wrestling with it up at Columbia, there is that. That hasn't changed, and the trajectory continues. But there's also the emerging um, possibilities of using and recognizing huge amounts of data and the uses of data as subjects of journalism, as tools of journalism, as opportunities of journalism. We are now in an era when computational science and data science are becoming much more routinely required of reporters at all levels. And I think one of the biggest big questions for journalism education is what does every student need to know and what do specializing students need to know? Because uh, the return to your 11th grade um, geometry and trig class is very real if you're coming into a modern newsroom thinking about how to interrogate with statistical accuracy, very complex sets of information that are crucial to doing your job. Yes, there's still a lot of journalism you can do on the street without ever meeting a number, and there's a lot of important journalism that will always be born of witnessing. But if you really want to hold power to account in this day and age, whether it's public power or private power, if you don't know how to interrogate the massive amounts of data or the algorithms that are being written to control the information you see as a consumer, then it's like going to um, knock on the doors of the Justice Department without knowing how to check on the private conflicts of uh, the Attorney General or uh, to use public records to double check people's disclosures about their personal finances and the sorts of blocking and tackling that good accountability reporters would, would always do. An algorithm today, which is simply a formula for trolling big piles of data and then delivering responses to you as a user, you encounter, you encounter an algorithm every time you search on Google, every time you buy a book on Amazon. An algorithm today is a source of power. And how are you going to question that power if you don't know what an algorithm is or how to explore the way a particular one is drawn up? So this is, a, a, this is really about the last few years I, I feel like this imperative has emerged and it's very complicated for a school to think about how to respond to that uh, on the fly in fast enough to really be valuable uh, both to the profession and to the students. And then the last thing I'd say is that this era of change and the, and the pace of it is only going to accelerate and make this job that much more exciting, if you like it, uh, interesting in the Chinese sense. Uh, and because the, the number of uh, technologies that are going to be relevant to journalism over the next uh, 10 years, I don't think we could possibly inventory them accurately now. I mean, take just one example. I mean, sensors and drones are now sort of fashionable tools of journalism that are being discussed, and they, they may end up being cul-de-sacs in some cases. They may be very powerful. I think in the case of sensors, they're likely to be very powerful over time. Um, sensors meaning passive collectors of information, atmospheric data or other information. They're used in lots of spheres. They're not so well used in journalism now, but they, I'm sure they will be over time. But I mean, take another example. Google Glasses, okay, we all see that this is, this gear is, this is like the equivalent of the, of the Radio Shack first laptop you carried as a reporter, the one with the little screen that uh, printed in digital. I mean, this is, this is to what virtual reality is going to be, the equivalent of what that laptop is to the current Apple array. The power of virtual reality, um, three-dimensional narrative is just beginning to be defined, and I feel reasonably sure that whenever it emerges in gaming and uh, communication and social media, it's also going to emerge in news. People are going to be literally wandering around with helmets on their heads consuming news content. And how, how you start to think in advance about how to equip uh, students to respond to that is, uh, you know, it's a fascinating challenge. The easiest thing to feel confident about, the thing that I feel the most confident about, is, uh, you know, evidenced by the example of the algorithm. We have to interrogate this technology for its relevance to journalism's public purpose. That's what we, at a, at, certainly at a journalism school, can do. Just because technology makes the map um, faster and prettier, illustration is a function of journalism. There's nothing wrong with that. But that is not 
what should dazzle us about this technology. Technology is valuable to the extent it advances the 150-year-old purposes of journalism in a democratic society, which you could easily list, but which I would very quickly uh, list as to include uh, holding public power to account, holding private power to account, holding closed institutions transparent before the publics uh, that they serve or preside over, um, bearing witness to complex and important events, telling stories, uh, particularly stories that are not um, heard for on behalf of populations that are marginalized or, dis or, or invisible in our society. All those purposes that you could see in 150 years of great journalism, they, they can be advanced by many of these technologies, um, but in confronting what the technology is for and how we teach it, it seems to me we have an obligation to uh, proceed from these enduring kind of values and aspirations because that is what has given journalism what credit it has earned from the public um, at intervals over, over the years. So I said there were uh, three other ideas I wanted to mention at less length, but I'll just uh, talk about them because I do think they're also very important. Um, one is uh, that the same technology that's created this narrative that I've just tried to sketch in the United States has also um, globalized uh, journalism just like it's globalized every other um, profession. You know, at Columbia, about 30% of our students now come from outside the United States, and it's exciting. They're coming from young democracies like uh, India or Brazil or from soft authoritarian countries where people aren't really sure how much journalism they're allowed to practice, say, like Turkey, which is a democracy but also a soft authoritarian country these days. Um, and the students who come into the classroom and join these conversations are coming from national traditions but also professional journalistic traditions that are really uh, distinct from but also very rapidly blending with the American tradition. So if you look at the big global newsrooms that are reaching global audiences, you heard from Kate O'Brien, Al Jazeera America, there's one example. Um, they're proliferating, especially in broadcasting. Um, not just the incumbents that we that some of you have worked at, but also um, international broadcasters crossing borders and becoming part of, say, the American media, the way the BBC has done, France, France Van Cat, the French uh, upstart competing with the BBC. You walk into these newsrooms where many Columbia alumni, by the way, are now leading uh, um, and and participating in this these kind of new experiments. A couple of things strike you first. All of them see their audiences as global. None of them really see their audiences as just inside a national tradition. And the second thing is that their, their newsrooms are, com are multinational. Uh, and there's really no pattern to who's in charge. I mean, you have uh, you know, Lebanese um, graphics artists sitting next to Australian uh, beat reporters sitting next to French producers all working in English. And then next to them are their uh, French language translators and their Arabic language translators. And it's, it's the same that you would see if you went out and looked at banking around the world or you know, any, any number of other rapidly uh, globalizing professions. But the way it's happening in journalism crowds in on the very kind of values and ethics and purposes that I described before. It becomes even more important not to succumb to a kind of relativism about why journalism matters or what kinds of ethical practices are acceptable. I mean, it's one thing uh, you know, to say that. It's another thing to teach it and to try to live it in these newsrooms. But I think we have, I feel like at Columbia, we have an even more redoubled obligation to make sure that our students come out under no, in, in no confusion about what constitutes ethical practice as a journalism and what constitutes eth ethical failure. And I sympathize with the, you know, the Nigerian student in the class who puts his hand up and says, but everybody pays for everything in Nigeria, and there's no way to, to uphold uh, this, the standards that you're articulating in my country. Well, you know, that is the way it is in a number of places that our students uh, come from, but that doesn't mean that, that that's um, uh, a different standard that we would honor. 
And there are other aspects of this globalization, including the opening up of journalism to citizens and activists. If you look at the coverage of the Syrian war in this last terrible year, or the worst international crisis in, you know, since uh, the Bosnian War, 100,000 um, 100, plus people dead, uh, millions of refugees in a very uh, difficult neighborhood. And the coverage has been diminishing with international interest in the war. It's also been diminishing because access to the battlefield has become almost impossible for Western correspondents because of ransom and ideological kidnapping. And so the world's information is increasingly delivered by citizen activists who are aligned with uh, insurgent groups or counterinsurgent groups and who are essentially the media arms of activists. And their information may be sincerely gathered and even credible and reliable, but it is not coming from a context of journalism, and yet it's being digested by journalists all over the world. So is another uh, way in which the globalization of journalism is really challenging. Um, finally, uh, two other ideas very quickly, and then I'll finish and take your questions. One is, uh, to me, the rise of, again, the reassertion of the importance of investigative reporting. I'm glad you had Walt in here. Um, it doesn't bother me that he has uh, three Pulitzers. He deserves six or seven. Uh, and he is an example of how, um, you know, I think, All of these structural changes in journalism have created, I went to, I was invited for reasons that I'll still never, I'll never understand by uh, John Kerry when he was chairing the Senate Commerce Committee to a hearing about the future of journalism. And I was uh, there with David Simon, the guy who wrote The Wire, um, a great Baltimore Sun investigative reporter, and Marissa Mayer, who now runs Yahoo, is then at Google, and Ariana Huffington, and you know, I, basically they all took up all the airtime, and I just sat there and uh, listened. But the funniest line of the, of the hearing was uh, David Simons, of course, when um, he was back and forth in some colloquy with the senators. And the senators were, you know, they were attentive and interesting as these things go. And uh, he said to them, you know, you should, you, should, you should be very happy. You should love the fact that you've got the job you have because you're living in the golden age of corruption. <laughs> uh, and, You know, I mean, the withdrawal of beat reporters, knowledgeable, professional, salaried reporters from uh, city council rooms, from, from zoning board hearings, from uh, county supervisor meetings, from school board meetings, all around the country, from state capitals. The numbers in Trenton would shock you. How many professional full-time reporters there were chasing the New Jersey government just seven years ago versus num the number today? I, I'm not going to give you the numbers because I don't remember them. I didn't write them down. But it's orders of magnitude shrunken. And uh, it's all around the country the way, the way this is happening. And it, it's a kind what you would, an economist would call it a market failure because a matter of public importance that the public would recognize as in its interest, that is, asking questions about whether politicians are bullying their opponents or whether they have conflicts of interest in their real estate holdings or whether the decisions that they're making in the name of the public are being undertaken with integrity and consistency, all the things that beat reporters would, would pound on, are simply uh, you know, not being scrutinized at the same level of intensity or professionalism as before. And so in that Uh, market failure, I think there's an imperative to emphasize the skills and the mission of investigative reporting more than ever before. And this is a, a form of journalism that, um, you know, can be taught and it can be learned in a reason. It's not easy. Uh, it does require mentorship and practice, but it's, um, it's, it is a concrete set of skills and practices that can be, that can be learned and that I think are of rising importance, both from a, a social and, de and democratic with a small d perspective, but also in order to carry journalism through this transition, we have to stand for something that the public recognizes again and again matters, and investigative reporting is an answer to those um, understandable questions. And then finally, the other idea that I feel is um, imperative for us to really stand up and engage with is, isn't, it basically involves free expression itself, the basis for um, free journalism. I think our generation lived through a period of relative stability in American First Amendment law from Sullivan and the Pentagon Papers 
through to WikiLeaks. Um, there were lots of bad practices, lots of bad subpoenas, lots of phony libel cases, but the general framework of um, federal constitutional law that allowed journalists to go about their basis was more favorable, I think, uh, than any other um, framework of national law ever in the history of at least post-Athenian, you know, democracy. And uh, that period of permissive press law coincided with um, big, strong, stable institutions that had the confidence to resist phony subpoenas and bad lawsuits. So, uh, you know, at the Washington Post, we never settled unless we had really done something awfully wrong. And we had the means to, to stand and, and struggle, uh, even if it was expensive and also a leadership culture uh, that was willing to do that, and that was true at many other large and confident news organizations. Well, it's hard to do that now if you're um, bleeding in front of your shareholders um, on the bottom line. And also WikiLeaks, digital technology, Snowden, and the Obama administration's own misguided aggression against leakers has uh, basically undone quite a lot of the space that journalism operated in at a time when journalism itself is losing confidence and there are quite legitimate questions about who is a journalist under the law and, and where should the law um, extend and stop. So I think for those of us in the university sphere, we have to, uh, because we preside over very large and durable institutions ourselves, we have to kind of stand up and, and speak to this and work on it. Um, so we, we spent two days, uh, as I mentioned at the top, uh, talking about the Pulitzer Prizes uh, last week. Um, it's been very interesting, and Nick did a fantastic job in so many ways um, as dean. One of the things he did, though, was to revive the kind of self-consciousness of the school about its founder and about its own history. So the school was created by uh, Joseph Pulitzer, of course, and so were the prizes endowed at the same time that the school was endowed, which is basically about 100 years ago. Uh, on Friday, I guess it was, as we were finishing the judging, or maybe it was Thursday, uh, we celebrated his, what would have been the 167th anniversary of his birth. So uh, securing the knowledge that Nick probably has told this story to one or two of you before, I'm going to very uh, briefly finish by just telling you something that I was astonished to discover when I came in this spring. I, I didn't know anything about Joseph Pulitzer. I thought, as the new dean, I probably ought to read a biography. So there are like two or three pretty good ones. And uh, I, I got advice about which one was the best. So Joseph Pulitzer was born in Hungary to a very large and very poor uh, Jewish family. Most of his brothers died uh, before he was 17. And he came to the United States because in, in the 1860s because he answered an ad for mercenaries that were being recruited by privileged young men in the Hudson Valley to substitute for them as soldiers in the Civil War in the era of the draft. So you could substitute uh, a mercenary if you were drafted in the North. I mean, you remember the Copperhead riots and all of that. I don't remember the exact timeline when the draft was reinstituted, but it was about 1863 or so, in the, in the bloodiest, darkest hours of the Civil War. So basically, everybody in New York got a draft notice if they were military age. And if you had the money or you could raise it from your village, you'd place ads in European newspapers uh, seeking mercenaries. So Pulitzer answered one of these ads and he came to the United States in like 1863, 1864, didn't speak a word of English, spoke only German, and he got himself into a cavalry unit that was made up only of German speakers who were all mercenaries substituting for draftees in the state of New York. And he basically spent uh, 1864 riding up and down the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia uh, never fired a shot, never encountered a Confederate soldier, but patrolled up and down the valley. His year of service was done. They all mustered out. Now he had rights of, you know, American migration, but still no English. So he went to uh, St. Louis because he understood that that's where the German speakers were. And he went out there and he got involved in basically post-war, crazy partisan post-war politics. He became a Democrat fiercely devoted to the Democrat, even though he had really no basis to completely absorb the conflict between the Republican and the Democratic parties. He got caught up in uh, post-war St. Louis politics. He became a newspaper man, essentially, as in those days, 
to advance his political uh, career, and he decided to start running for office. So he was running for some kind of, he was involved in some local election, and he learned how to do investigative reporting about his Republican opponents, and he found a particular opponent that he was challenging and did a big investigation about his business conflicts and found some and published them. And the guy was so angry that he came to the newsroom and uh, Pulitzer pulled out a pistol and shot him. <laughs> so he, he didn't kill him, but he wounded him. And in fact, through the rest of his career, uh, he was sort of dogged by occasional subpoenas relating to that case. But eventually he came to New York, learned English, founded the New York World, made a great fortune over on, uh, right by the entrance to what's now the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, and in his late life, started to think about the future of journalism. And he wrote this big essay in the North American Review that anticipates 100 years of professional journalism in the 20th century. And it concludes, uh, it contains this line, which is now sort of a founding motto of uh, our school, but also is, I think, uh, resonant of the dilemmas presented by the coverage of the, of the Boston um, Marathon bombings. A republic and its press will rise or fall together, enable disinterested, public-spirited press with trained intelligence to know the right and the courage to do it, can preserve that public virtue without which popular government is a sham and a mockery. A cynical, mercenary, demagogic press will produce in time a people as base as itself. Thank you.